Oh, hello everybody. So good to good to meet you all. Um, so my name's Ian, and I, um, uh, as as, as uh, Julia said, I'm a planetary scientist from the University of London in the UK, and I'm interested in the moon. And I've been interested in the moon for a very long time. I was um, about your age when people. Well, I, I don't know how old all of you are, but I was I was um, I was eight in 1969 when people landed on the moon for the very first time. And, and the moon has been of interest to me ever since. So I want to talk today about why we should go back to the moon and what we um, will learn if we do go back to the moon. And in particular, I want to talk about this concept of a moon village or a moon base, which would be like building a, um, a um, well, a very small village to start with, but hopefully it might grow one day into something a bit bigger. And I've got this picture. Um, I, I don't suppose any of you will recognize it. This is, a, this is a picture of a really big moon base. But I'm, I'm showing it to you because it was quite inspirational to me when I was about 14. Because in, in, in 1975, there was this British children's sci-fi series appeared on the television and it was called Space 1999. And it was all about what space would be like in 1999. <laughs> which seemed, you know, a long way in the future when I was 14. Um, and we were going to have this huge moon base in 1999. And of course, we haven't got that yet. So, so but anyway, I hope one day we will have something like this. Um, all these Space 1999 um, stories are available on YouTube, should anyone want to want to watch them. Uh, and it's all about like, uh, all these excitements and activities in this moon base. But anyway, 1999 was already 21 years ago and still we don't have a moon base. So I want to say why well, I think we should have one and what we might do with one when we build one in the future. Uh, I wanted to start with this really beautiful picture. Uh, it's a picture of the Earth, of course, from the moon. And it's one of the first pictures ever taken of our planet from the moon. This was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts in 1968. And it shows our beautiful blue planet in the background uh, against the sort of desolate surface of the moon in the foreground. And compared to our planet, of course, the moon is quite a desolate place. But I think, nevertheless, we'll learn if we explore the moon, it'll tell us a lot about the moon, of course, but it will also tell us a lot about our own planet. And, and the reason I think that is the moon has been stuck with the Earth all the time. For the whole history of the solar system, the moon has been orbiting the Earth. So everything, things that have happened to the moon have happened to the moon as well. So if you'd like to, if you keep this thought in your minds that by exploring the moon, we're exploring the moon, but of course we are also exploring our own planet in a way. Um, so this was taken by Apollo 8, which was the first time human, Apollo 8 didn't land on the moon, of course, but it was the first time that humans ever left Earth orbit to visit another planet, another planetary body, the moon, and look, look, look back. Um, so I want to use this picture from the very beginning of the Apollo program to, um, uh, oh, my arrow doesn't work, that's better, to say a little bit about Apollo, because Apollo was 50 years ago, um, but it was really inspirational to me, and we learnt a lot of science from Apollo, and so as background to thinking about going back to the moon, I, I think it's worth saying a little bit about Apollo. So between 1969 and 1972, American astronauts traveled to the moon during the Apollo missions. There were six successful landings on the moon during the Apollo program. Um, picture on the left here shows this enormous rocket, the Saturn V rocket, that was required to um, get the astronauts from the surface of the Earth to uh, into space and, and to the moon. So this enormous rocket, it's almost all, um, I hope you can see my pointer, this is, this is the launch of Apollo 17, which is the only, which is the last Apollo mission in 1972 and the only one to get launched at night. So it must have been a tremendously spectacular sight. But this huge rocket is almost all fuel and it's all required to get the astronauts who are living in this little capsule at the top fast enough to escape from the, um, from the Earth. Now I might ask you a question, which you can answer in the chat and Julia can monitor. <laughs> just, just how fast do you think we have to go in order to escape from the Earth? How fast does this rocket have to get? Any rocket, I mean, yesterday, I hope you noticed NASA launched the Perseverance mission to Mars. That rocket, not as big as a Saturn V rocket, but quite a big rocket to get 
the Perseverance rover to escape from Earth. So you need these big rockets because you have to travel really fast. So I'm just interested to know whether people know how fast you have to go to escape the Earth. Anyway, while you're thinking about that, uh, the picture at top, top right here shows a schematic of um, the Apollo um, hardware. Th this is the capsule. This is a service module uh, in which just contains oxygen tanks and things. And all that's this bit on the, on the rocket stack. And the only bit people are staying in, three men cramped into these um, small, uh, this small capsule here. And then in this part of the rocket, just below the command and service module, this, this bit here, there's a, an empty space in which the lunar module was stored, which is the machine that had to actually land on the moon. Um, and this picture at the bottom right shows, the, shows an Apollo command and service module, so this bit here, um, in orbit about the moon. I think this was actually Apollo 15. Um, photographed, of course, from the Apollo 15 lunar module. So that um, uh, obviously there has to be a, somewhere to take the photograph from. <laughs> so at this stage, the Apollo, the Apollo, the, the, the way this worked is the Apollo capsule uh, command module, uh, once in space, had to turn around, dock with this command module, dock with this lunar module, pull the lunar module out of this housing, turn around again and head off to the moon with the lunar module stuck to its nose. And then when it gets to the moon, the lunar module has two people, two astronauts crawl into the lunar module, one astronaut stays behind, lunar module is separated from the command module and goes down to the moon. And it's at that stage during Apollo 15 that one of the astronauts took this picture. Um, anyway, Julia, how fast do people think we have to travel to uh, escape from the Earth? So you had all types of answers. So uh, some people say the speed of sound. A lot faster than that. So um, the answers range from 120 miles per hour to far faster than airplane to seven miles per second. That's about right. In fact, that's correct. Um, someone says Mach 20. That might be right as well. <laughs> I, don't how, I don't know how fast that the speed of sound is. I'd have to work that out. So, so some, some of the, 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 the seven miles per second answer is in the, certainly about right. So I, because in Europe, we think in kilometers per second, um, the answer is 11 kilometers per second. So that would be seven or eight uh, miles per second. So that's really, you think about that. 11 kilometers per second. Um, so, and, and if you don't go that fast, you'll fall back down again. So, so you have to travel that fast or you won't escape from the earth. And that's why we need these huge, these huge rockets. Otherwise you just can't get into space at all. Anyway, here's a, a couple of pictures just to illustrate how Apollo worked 50 years ago. So there on the left, you see a, a beautiful picture of an Apollo lunar module. That's Apollo 14, I think, sitting on the lunar surface. Um, it's this spidery spacecraft. Um, so in space, um, spacecraft don't have to be like streamlined. They have to be streamlined like rockets to get out of the Earth's atmosphere. But in a vacuum, you can make a spacecraft any shape. You don't have to make it streamlined. And, and the lunar modules were not. They're very spidery looking beasts with um, uh, two, but this is essentially a two-stage rocket. There's this um, landing bit with the legs and then the only part of this vehicle that humans were living in, the two astronauts during their stay on the moon, were staying in this bit at the top, very cramped. Um, I don't know how many, it's quite difficult to see where this, some of this hardware. Those of you who live in the US, uh, if you haven't already, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington and the Kennedy Space Center in Florida have excellent uh, examples of these, these um, um, this, 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 these, these vehicles to have a look at. Um, anyway, it's quite cramped inside here for two people, but nevertheless, that's what they had to do because this was the only part of the lunar module with a pressurized atmosphere inside. Um, and then once the astronauts had finished exploring the moon, it's only this top bit took off again to rendezvous with the command and service module that had been left orbiting the moon. And here is a picture on the right showing, this is the Apollo 11 ascent, so that's the, the top bit, the top stage of the lunar module, coming back up to rendezvous with the uh, command module in lunar orbit. So when this photograph was taken, um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were inside here, and this photograph was taken um, 
Oh, wow, this is terrible. My, my mind's gone blank. Someone can perhaps remind me in the chat. The Apollo, the Apollo, uh, the Apollo 11 uh, command module pilot who didn't, it'll come to me. Anyway, um, took this picture. It's a nice picture. I'll show the, the crescent Earth in the background rising above the horizon of the moon. You can tell the lunar module here is on its way. Um, Collins, his first name will come to me. Mike, Mike Collins, the Apollo 11 commands. And so, did anyone get that in the chat, Julian? Yes, Next they did. Mike Collins. Um, uh, took this picture and show, you can see the spacecraft's coming on its way back because it's not got its legs. Right? The legs are left behind on the moon during the Apollo missions. And then when they got to the moon, they could start exploring. And so all the Apollo astronauts did quite a lot of exploring. But I think from a, I'm a planetary geologist and, and, and rocks and things interest me. And the most geology got done on the moon during the, I mean, all the Apollo missions collected rock samples. And this is very important. But the last three, the last three Apollo missions, 15, 16 and 17, were the most um, efficient from a scientific point of view, I think, because they carried with them this machine. So this is the moon buggy, um, which is a small electric car, officially called a lunar raving vehicle. This is Apollo 15, this huge mountain in the background here is a, um, a 4,000 meter high, I'm sorry, I don't know how high that is in feet, 4,000 meter high mountain on the moon called Mount Hadley. Uh, this astronaut is James Irwin, one of the two Apollo 15 moonwalkers. And he's just preparing the moon buggy for its first trip. Um, and these plastic bags, you see these plastic bags hanging off the back here. These are the plastic bags in which rock samples were collected and brought back to Earth. And we're still, 50 years later, we're still studying these rocks brought back by the Apollo missions. Now, at this point, um, this is the past. So now I want to go into the future. Um, and at this point, I've got this video to show you. So this video, so it's a blank screen until I start it, but this video was produced by the European Space Agency a couple of years ago on the um, international plans for returning to the moon. It starts with a little bit of history, actually. It starts with Apollo, in fact, it starts a bit before Apollo, so it will help set in context some of the things I've already said. Um, and then it will talk a bit about Apollo, and then it will talk about our future uh, hopes for exploring the moon. Um, it's about eight minutes long. I may stop it from time to time and ask questions, but we'll see how we go. And hopefully if I click this uh, button, it will start. And if it doesn't, Julia, you'll have to tell me. <laughs> so here we go. The European Space Agency is working to take humans beyond low Earth orbit and deeper into the cosmos. Our next destination on this journey is the moon. The 1960s and 70s were an incredible era for space exploration. The Ranger missions from the United States took close up images of the moon before eventually impacting the surface. NASA surveyor missions demonstrated a controlled soft landing at the surface of the moon and tested the properties of lunar soil to prepare for future human missions. So I just I just pause it here just to draw your attention to where it, where these little shapes have landed. These are the correct places. So this shows where on the moon uh, all of these spacecraft landed. So you get a sense for the kind of geographical area sort of the moon that uh, we've been um, we've explored so far. Um, I just want to put something else into context for you. I mean the moon is a lot smaller than the Earth. Um, but its surface area, it's about the same as Africa, basically. If you took Africa and Saudi Arabia together and, and wrapped them into a, into a sphere, then that would have a surface area about equal to the moon. So actually there's a lot of land to explore on the moon. We've only explored a little bit of it. And as will become obvious to you as this proceeds, I hope, um, that the moon has another, there are two sides to the moon. I mean, this is the full moon, uh, as it's the side of the moon that we see from the Earth. Of course, the moon has a far side as well, which we've never seen from the Earth. Um, and you have to be in space to see the far side of the moon. And uh, I'm not sure whether James mentions it. Um, did I introduce James? 
the narrator is James Carpenter, my colleague James Carpenter at the European Space Agency. Um, I, don't, I don't think, James, I'm not sure whether James will mention it, but only one spacecraft in the whole history of the space age has landed on the far side of the moon. And while you're watching the video, people might like to tell Julia in the chat what that spacecraft was and who launched it. Uh, all the other things that have landed on the moon have landed on the far side, oh, sorry, have landed on the near side. So as, I, as will become apparent as I let the video continue. A series of Soviet landers and rovers visited a number of locations, performing scientific investigations, driving across the surface and returning samples to Earth. But the pinnacle of this period of exploration was Apollo and the arrival of humans at the surface of another solar system body for the first and only time in history. Looking back now, though, we see that only a tiny fraction of the moon's surface has been explored, all on the side of the moon that faces the Earth and in a region close to the equator. We've also discovered that all of the samples we have... So I just cut James off again. Who has anyone? So he didn't mention. So when this video was made, what he said was right. But since then, there has been a spacecraft landed on the far side of the moon. And has anybody got it? Um, Julia? Yeah, they got the Chinese Change Four. Yep, Changi Four on the far side. So that was earlier this year or last year. I think it was the end of last year. If yeah, December. Correctly. Yes, I think you're right. Anyway, so Chang Changi 4 landed on the far side of the moon for the first time ever. Um, I just want to draw your attention to so the green dots here are the Apollo landing sites. Um, this was Apollo 11 here. This is the Sea of Tranquility. Um, um, this was Apollo 12 there. I'm going to show you some soil samples collected by Apollo 12 later, so bear that in mind. Apollo 13, of course, didn't land. I hope everyone's seen the movie, Apollo 13. Um, Apollo 14 landed there. Uh, this is 15. This is 16. And I'm going to show you some pictures from Apollo 17, which was about there. But as James has just said, they're all on the near side of the moon, and almost all of them, with except for this lunar hod. Uh, oh, this is Changi, Changi 3. Um, and this is one of the Russian lunar hods most of them quite close to the equator nothing nothing on the nothing near the poles well this is a ranger impact near tycho nothing very near the poles and nothing on the far side at all so still a lot of the moon still to be explored uh, julie if anyone comes with any pressing questions do let me just do let me know turn to earth are from an unusual region with a complex and exotic chemistry of potassium phosphor and rare earth elements such as thorium the vast majority of the moon has yet to be explored, including the entire far side. One thing that we can say for certain is that if we want to understand the moon, then we need to go back there. Now, after decades of waiting, an armada of missions from around the world, including ESA Smart One, have returned to explore the moon from orbit. Looking down from above, these missions are providing a wealth of new data, bringing a new understanding and raising new questions. They are giving us a global insight and preparing for new missions to the surface led by... I've just asked, there's, a, there's an interesting structure here. <laughs> this round, very large round thing. I don't know, people might like to guess what it is. China's Chang'e 3. And the next wave of missions to the surface? Where might they go? The next destination will be unlike anywhere we have been before the extreme and alien landscape of the lunar South Pole. Here, we find areas of permanent darkness and extreme cold, where water, ice and other chemicals can become trapped. And as we come up from these lowlands, we see towering peaks basking in near constant light. On these polar mountains, the sun rarely sets below the horizon providing the potential for near continuous solar power and a spectacular view over the rugged and cratered landscape below. In 2009, the El Cross mission blasted water and other chemicals out of a permanently dark crater in the South Polar region, allowing it to be observed by nearby spacecraft for the very first time. We also now know 
that there are nearby locations with similar cold conditions. Is there water here too? If so, how much is there? Where did it come from? And what can it teach us about the origins of water and life-forming chemistry on Earth? This water may have been delivered by comets and asteroids impacting into the surface over billions of years. It may even have been created at the surface of the moon. We now know that protons thrown out by the sun in the solar wind arrive at the lunar surface. Here, they react with oxygen in minerals to create a thin layer of water. These water molecules can be lifted by the sun's heat before falling again to the surface. Over time, these particles may move to the polar regions where they're trapped by the cold conditions. And as we stand at the pole with the Earth in view, we can point our antennas to the sky to search for So we have oh, that's interesting. Some, some questions here. If yeah, okay. I'm happy to answer the questions. What I don't know is why my video has stopped. What happens if I... It's probably loading. Faint uh, signals. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, while it gets itself together, I'll try and answer some questions. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so uh, people were wondering why uh, we had so few spacecrafts visiting the far side of the moon. Um, some people thought maybe it takes um, more fuel, um, so they were... Uh, well, so it's the, I think the main reason is it's just more, um, it's more complicated to operate a spacecraft on the far side of the moon because of course the far side of the moon can't see the earth. So you can't, you've got no direct line of sight for a radio wave to to travel, so communications is difficult. It's only possible if you've put a communication satellite in orbit about the moon, so that a, uh, which the Chinese did for their Chang'e 4 mission, so that then you can um, bounce a radio wave off a satellite orbiting the moon down to the far side, because the far side, you can't see the Earth directly. And I think during Apollo, this was considered just an extra complication that would make it just more dangerous and not, not really I mean, it would be very interesting. There are many interesting things on the far side, but but I think certainly during Apollo, it was considered probably too risky given the difficulties in communication. Um, actually, that point, uh, I hope my video will start again when I click this, but we'll see. But the next little segment about this video is about doing radio astronomy from the moon. And um, the point James is about to make is that uh, the far side of the moon, you can't see the earth. So, so that's that's not very helpful if you want to communicate with the Earth. But if you want to do radio astronomy, it's fantastic because it means no terrestrial radio interference can reach the far side of the moon. So the far side of the moon is probably the most radio quiet place in the solar system. And so actually it's probably an excellent place to do radio astronomy from, uh, which is what James is gonna uh, try and do now. Let me see if this video picks itself up. Out in space. Here we go. But radio noise from the Earth is too loud and blocks out many cosmic radio sources. But as we move over the horizon, the Earth sets out of view. The noise disappears and a new kind of radio sky emerges. We see our galaxy and the planets as never before. And beyond, a quiet radio hum. A signal from the cosmic dark ages more than 13 billion years ago when the first cosmic structures were formed. And now, beneath us, the moon as we see it today, scarred by craters formed by billions of years of impacts. And the largest and the oldest of these, the South Pole Aitken Basin, formed by a powerful impact around four billion years ago Many believe that its formation marks the start of a dramatic period of bombardment onto the Earth and the Moon, an era called the Cataclysm. This era is recorded on the Moon's scarred surface. So this is a good place to ask whether anyone guessed what the round bullseye shaped thing I pointed to was. Oh, they said the crater. Yeah, so it is. It's a so. huge, it's a very large crater. It's one of these so-called impact basins. 
Um, that one is called um, uh, the Oriental Basin, which uh, um, uh, is probably the most recent of the... So what James is showing here are these really large meteorite impacts onto the moon, which have left these huge craters. And that Oriental uh, structure that I, that, I, that I brought your attention to uh, was probably the most recent of the really big... Uh, meteorite impacts onto the surface of the moon, which is why it's so relatively well preserved and it still looks like a bullseye target. Anyway, I'll let James carry on. And its end coincides with the appearance of the earliest observed traces of life on Earth. In the coming years, we will see explorers at the lunar poles, exploiting the extended sunlight for power, and performing research to benefit life on Earth and to understand our place in the universe. This will begin with small robotic missions to understand the environment and prove new technologies to pave the way for the future. We will then move on to increasingly ambitious missions with humans and robots working together, learning to live and work at the surface and performing new and important scientific research this new exploration will be achieved, not in competition as in the past, but through peaceful international cooperation. Eventually, we will see a sustained infrastructure for research and exploration, where humans will live and work for prolonged periods. Here, we will put into practice the lessons of years on the International Space Station to establish a facility akin to those that we see in Antarctica today. Okay, I think that's probably enough of the video because James has ended there with what he's been leading up to is building a moon base, a bit like an Antarctic base. And that is a theme I want to um, develop a little bit. So does anyone have any quest quick questions on the video before I move on? Let's give people a minute. So there was one question whether the solar power is a good source of energy for a lunar base. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Solar power is an excellent source of power for a lunar base uh, because the, um, the moon has no, um, no atmosphere, no clouds. Uh, sunlight reaches the surface with nothing to stop it. Um, except during the night, of course. So there is uh, the moon, that's another question, uh, I'm maybe asking too many questions, but people might be have a quick guess as to how long a lunar night is. So the moon rotates uh, like does the Earth, and so the, any part of the surface of the moon has a day-night period. So on the Earth, a day is roughly 12 hours long and a night is 12 hours long. On the moon, it's a different number. Oh, I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Um, uh, and this would make operating, so obviously solar power wouldn't work during the lunar night. Um, except if you're near the lunar poles, which is a point I'm going to come to in a minute, because James has already made the point, the first moon base will probably be at the lunar pole. Uh, at the lunar north and south poles, the sun is almost always above the horizon. So you don't really have a day-night cycle at the lunar poles. And so this would make uh, sunlight um, uh, by far the best source of energy to power a, a moon base because the sun is almost almost always available. Um, were there any answers to how uh, long the lunar night is? 48 hours was the answer. No, not on the moon. So on the moon, it takes the moon uh, a month basically to rotate about its own axis. So a lunar day, um, daylight, on a given point on the lunar surface, daylight lasts for about two weeks and then nighttime lasts for two weeks as well. So that's, um, that's an awfully long time, two weeks in total darkness, where, during which you wouldn't be able to power anything with solar power and during which time it gets really, really cold about, I'm sorry, in the UK we work in degrees Celsius, so about minus 180 degrees Celsius. Um, and it, 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 so um, some other power source would be required if you wanted to operate during the lunar night. Um, nuclear power source would be uh, ideal in many ways. Whereas at the lunar poles, you wouldn't need an alternative power source because the sun is almost always available on the horizon during the whole lunar rotation period. And so that, that's one of the things that makes the lunar poles a special, uh, special place. 
special places. So right. another so, question was oh, yeah. just a second, uh, whether the radiation from space would really affect the base? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question and a very important one. So the, the surface of the moon is not protected from radiation from space because it has no atmosphere and no magnetic field, unlike the Earth. So the moon is prone to radiation. It's prone as the most damaging type of radiation would be solar flares. So every so often you have these huge explosions on the surface of the sun called solar flares and they produce charged particles which are mostly protons which fly out at high speed through the solar system and this, this would be very damaging radiation to humans um, on the surface of the moon. So it's true that any moon base would require some sort of shelter into which astronauts could hide if uh, a solar flare were to occur. Um, so it's a very good question and it is a very important for the designers of moon bases. Uh, radiation protection, especially protection from solar flares, would be a really, really important thing um, to think about. So that's a very, very excellent question. And there is another discussion going on here that what if we put railroad around the moon so you could actually move your space base following the day. So that's, that's, a, that's an excellent idea as well. I mean, that would be a hugely, um, huge engineering challenge <laughs> to build a, build a movable base that would go all the way around the moon every month. Um, so I don't know how practical that would be, but it's a nice idea. And it reminds me of a science fiction story I once read. There's a science fiction book by the American sci-fi author, Kim Stanley Robinson. And he wrote a book envisaging what the solar system might be like in um, 300 years time. And he wrote the book in 2012 and his book's called 2312. <laughs> and in 2312, he envisages on the moon, he envisages a, a, um, a human base on Mercury. Now Mercury is even worse because you're so close to the sun that you have to stay not in the sun. <laughs> and so he put his whole base on a, a railway track around the whole planet Mercury uh, so that it could keep moving out of the sun. Um, I mean, that, I, I don't think, so. I mean, it's, it's probably impossible, right? You think of the engineering difficulties to build such a thing, but, but it still, it shows it's a really good question and someone else has thought of it. Um, put a movable base to keep yourself either in the sun if you want to or out of the sun if you want to. But <laughs> Okay, we better move on or we run out of time. So, so that was a bit of the history and a bit of the planning for the future. Now, the good news is the American Space Agency, NASA, now has this plan to uh, return astronauts to the moon fairly soon. Um, so the current planning would be for 2024. It's not really clear how, I mean, that's in four years time, right? This is a really ambitious times line and it's not clear to me that whether it's realistic. But nevertheless, if it's not 2024, it, you know, it might be done a few years after that. Uh, this is the Artemis mission. Artemis, by the way, in Greek mythology is the uh, sister. I mean, she's a moon goddess in Greek mythology, but crucially, she's also the sister of Apollo. So that's um, quite aptly named. So the Artemis, the Art, Art, Artemis uh, mission hopefully will land people on the moon in the coming years. And this um, shows a, um, a diagram of an Artemis lander, which would visit the south pole of the moon. And I was going to ask a question. Maybe, maybe I'll tell you the answer because otherwise we run out of time. But if you look at this lander, it's a bit strange. It's got these huge, these are solar panels, of course, for electrical power. But it looks a bit odd. The solar panels are vertical. <laughs> They stack up vertically into the sky, whereas you kind of think if you want to collect sunlight, you'd have the solar panels horizontal. And the answer to this, you, you probably guessed, is, is Artemis is going to the poles of the moon. And I, I just told you that the poles of the moon, uh, the sun is almost always on the horizon. So at the poles of the moon, the sun will always be low in the sky. So to collect as much sunlight as possible, you need vertical solar panels. So it looks a bit odd, but that's why this has been drawn the way it has. Um, so Artemis isn't going to build a moon base, but it would it would finally 50 years, 50 years after Apollo, once again have us with humans on the on the moon, which will be fantastic. So James in his talk, I'm getting on to moon bases now, he briefly said towards the end of the video that 
the idea might be to build a base on the moon a bit like the bases we have in Antarctica. So this is this is not on the moon, of course. You can see all this snow and ice. This is this is the Amundsen Scott research station at the lunar south pole. Um, but research stations like this in Antarctica enable lots of scientists, geologists, biologists, atmospheric scientists, astronomers, all to do their research in Antarctica because they're they're supported by this um, uh, these 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 Antarctic bases. So the idea is, if we had some something similar to an Antarctic base on the Moon, it too would be able to support a whole range of different exploration and scientific activities. So this is a Moon base is at least at least for the next few decades. It's more likely to look something like this than uh, Moon Base Alpha, which was the Moon Base in space 1999, which was almost like a city. So a real, a real Moon Base in the coming decade is going to be much more uh, smaller than, than Moon Base Alpha, and it's going to look much more like an Antarctic research station. So here's a nice artist's impression of one. This is also an ESA drawing. Again, notice the solar panels are vertical. So that again tells you this has been planned to visit a pole, a pole of the Moon where the sunlight comes from very low down near the horizon. Um, some habitats. Now notice the person who asked the question about radiation, the, the, so the, these, these sort of modules are the kind of modules, a bit like space station modules that people would live in. But you see they've been covered by these uh, concrete type mounds. And this, this would be the radiation protection. If you, um, if you shield a hab habitat by about a meter, so three feet of, um, of, or soil would do, uh, or concrete, but three feet of something, a meter of something uh, solid will um, block out almost all the cosmic rays, certainly the solar wind and solar flare cosmic rays. So you need to shield the habitats um, underground somehow. And so you could either build them underground, which would be quite difficult, um, or you could build them above ground and then cover them with something, which is what the artist has drawn here. So that's why they is drawn like this, with radiation protection. These mounds, essentially the radiation protection. Here's a big rover, but unlike the, the Apollo um, electric rovers, this is a much bigger rover, of course. You can see it's got a cab. And so the idea here is the rover would be pressurized. And so the astronauts wouldn't need to be in a spacesuit to drive these rovers. They'd be in a pressurized environment and this would enable them to do a lot more um, exploring than was possible during Apollo. Um, so what would we do from a moon base? Well, we could do a lot, of, a lot of exploration, of course, and we could do a lot of science. We could do geology. And this picture shows the, um, the, yeah, there's only one geologist been to the moon. People might very quickly in the chat like to tell me who they think he is. Um, uh, one, one, and this is a photograph of him. Apollo 17, which was the last Apollo to the moon in December 1972. This person here, uh, who's still alive, um, is the first uh, person to, with a geology degree, and the, first, the only scientist to have gone to the moon so far. And so a, getting more geologists to the moon would be really good, and they could operate out of a moon base, and we'd learn a lot about the moon. Uh, Julia, did anyone have the name of this uh, astronaut? Not yet. Uh, Harrison Smith. Yeah, Harrison Schmidt, so Jack Schmidt. Um, so Jack, uh, Schmidt uh, gained his PhD in geology um, from Harvard, I think, in 1964. And here he is on the moon in December 1972. Um, as James mentioned in the video, we could also do astronomy from the moon. We could do biology from the moon because we could learn how the lunar environment, the low gravity and the radiation environment of the moon affects well, human beings and also other living things, uh, which we might want to know about if we want to send people further out into the solar system. The moon is close to the Earth, so we can use the moon to understand the Earth. And crucially, we could, if we build a moon base, we'd learn how to live and work in space, which we will need to know if we ever want to go to Mars, for example, or other places. So the moon would be an excellent place to learn how to live and work in space. So these are all potential benefits of building a moon base. Right, so here is some, some moon rocks. So this is the geology side. Um, so this is slightly, um, uh, slightly autobiographical about me. Um, this, uh, we are working at Birkbeck College at the moment on some Apollo 12 soil samples. This, this, in this uh, container here are some samples of lunar soil collected by the Apollo 12 mission in 1969. 
And here is, uh, th these are curated in the, uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where all the Apollo rocks are curated. And the way, um, the way slightly this works is if you wish to study moon rocks, you have to write to NASA and say, I'd like to study some moon rocks, please. And they, they think about this and they send it out to a committee that decides whether your proposal is good enough. And if it is, they invite you to go to the Johnson Space Center to collect the moon rocks. So this shows, uh, this is me in the, in the middle here. Uh, and these are my two colleagues who are then my, my PhD students, Joshua Snape and Catherine Joy, um, who are both now really leading planetary scientists, I'm proud to say. Um, anyway, here we were in the Johnson Space Center in Houston collecting these little chips of Apollo 12 soils that we're, um, we're studying. So, so the point about returning to the moon is, I mean, we do have moon rock returned to the Earth by the Apollo astronauts, of course. But as you saw, the Apollo missions only went to six places on the moon, um, not, not, nothing from the far side, nothing from the poles. And so in planetary geology, lunar geology, there's a pressing need to collect samples from other parts of the moon. And so a return to the moon would enable us to do that. Now uh, this, this, this thing here, just so you've noticed, this is the sample number. Um, 12 here means Apollo 12, and then sample 23 from Apollo 12. Uh, one of the things we can learn from the moon and studying the moon rocks is the history of meteorite impacts. Um, this shows a large crater, it's in the middle of the far side, it's called Daedalus Crater. It's about 90 kilometers across, so it's 50 miles, I suppose. Um, so it's a large impact crater. Um, but the thing about the moon is it's preserved lots and lots of all small craters, all sorts of sizes of craters. Now, the same kinds of asteroids that were hitting the moon uh, were hitting the Earth, of course. And the only reason the Earth isn't covered in craters like the moon, well, I might ask this question, why is the Earth not covered in craters like the moon, <laughs> given that the moon has been right next to the Earth all this time? So that's a question for you. Um, and so, but the point is, um, the Earth isn't covered in craters, but we think the Earth should have been hit by just as many meteorites as the Moon was hit by. So by studying the Moon and working out the ages of these craters, and you need the rocks to determine the ages of things on planetary surfaces, we can determine the rate at which meteorites were hitting the Moon. But this also tells us the rate at which meteorites have been hitting the Earth, which is something we might want to know. Does anyone have a quick answer, Julia? Why is the Earth not coming? So you had tons of different answers. You had answers like trees. So trees don't make any difference. Oceans. Oceans do make a difference, of course, in that we wouldn't see meteorites that had struck the oceans. That's true. Atmosphere. That's true as well, in that relatively small meteorites burn up in the atmosphere. We see them as shooting stars, of course, so they don't hit the surface. Uh, some people say magnetic field. So that doesn't shield us from meteorites. And um, erosion. Yeah, so that's the main thing. So it's true, small meteorites burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, but a meteorite that made the Daedalus crater here, so 90 kilometers across, the meteorite would have been about 10 kilometers across, so six miles or something. Something as big as that can't burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. It must hit the surface and make a big crater. But of course the Earth is full of rain and um, snow and winds and a crater like this on the Earth would very rapidly fill with water, be eroded, filled with sediment uh, and eventually washed away. Whereas the moon has none of those processes, no atmosphere, no rain, no liquid water. So uh, the moon preserves the history of the bombardment of planets by meteorites and the earth does not. And so this is just one example of the things that the earth, the moon can tell us about the solar system that the earth can't. And so it's just one reason for wanting to go back to the moon. So there was a question earlier whether it's safe to build a moon base because of all this bombardment. Yeah, that's an excellent question as well. So the good news is yes, it is, because big impacts like this are really, really rare. I mean, millions of years apart. Now it is true, the small meteorites that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere uh, don't burn up on the moon because there is no atmosphere. So there is this continual flux of small millimeter sized meteorites um, that will strike the surface of the moon. So that though will require shielding from, 
um, was never a problem during Apollo, and that's because well, they were on the moon for only a few days at a time, of course. But most of these meteorites are so small that the, the spacesuits themselves were designed to protect against them. And certainly anything like the meter thick shielding that you need anyway to protect against radiation will also protect against micrometeorites. But it is an excellent question and it is another of those things. An engineer designing a moon base, it is another thing that he or she would need to have in mind uh, to, when they're designing the moon base to protect against micrometeorites. So that's an excellent question. Uh, studying, studying the Earth. Now this is a beautiful picture. This was taken by the Japanese spacecraft um, Kaguya about 10 years ago. So Japanese robotic lunar orbiter and it took this picture. It's a real picture. This It's not been uh, photoshopped in any way. The, um, the spacecraft is proceeding over the south pole of the moon uh, from the far side towards the near side. Um, this is a 20 kilometer diameter crater here called Shackleton and the south pole of the moon is exactly there where my pointer is. So the spacecraft's flying over the south pole of the moon uh, and it's caught, caught, caught the earth and now you can see that uh, the south pole of the moon is the right way up. Uh, so the earth is upside down. Uh, I hope you can see, uh, we're running out of time so I can't ask you to guess but yeah, I hope you can recognize this is the constant, this is Australia and this is Southeast Asia here. So the, moon, the Earth looks upside down from a Northern Hemisphere perspective because we're on the South Pole of the Moon. <laughs> the South Pole of the Moon is the right way up. Um, and so, and as James said, because this, and as, as I've mentioned several times, the, the, because the Sun is always on the horizon of the lunar poles, there's a lot of shadow. So craters like Shackleton here are full of um, shadow. They never see the Sun. And so this means they're really very cold. They're about minus um, 250, 230 Celsius. Um, and, and they're so cold that water ice is stable in a vacuum at those temperatures. So there's a lot of, um, I've been dawning on the lunar science community for many years now that in, the, in these permanently shadowed craters, water is probably stable as ice. And then there's, as James did say in the video, there's this one experiment, the, the NASA's LCROSS mission, which crashed into one of these permanently shadowed craters and does seem to have dug up some water ice. So there's also experimental evidence that water ice exists in these very cold permanently shadowed craters. So this is a very, very useful thing to know about because scientifically this water is interesting. It's probably come from comets, and so studying it would tell us about where water on the Earth, which may also have come from comets, has come from. So these beautiful blue oceans on the Earth, much of that water has probably come from space, um, and some of it may be frozen on the Moon. So that's scientifically interesting to study. But also, if you were going to build a Moon base, and so I said that if you're if you're at the poles of the Moon, not in a crater, if you're on say a, a mountain like this mountain here, or this little hill here then the sunlight is almost always, the sun is almost always above the horizon. So this is, you could build a moon base here with its vertical solar panels, collect a lot of uh, sunlight, but nearby you've got permanent shadow where water ice may be present. And so that's a source of water for you and water is going to be very useful for a moon base. I mean obviously humans need water to survive, but also the water can be split into hydrogen and oxygen. Humans need oxygen to breathe. Hydrogen and oxygen is a very useful rocket fuel. So, so by mining water uh, and therefore hydrogen and oxygen from permanently shadowed craters and processing it with sunlight from a base built where the sunlight is plentiful nearby, um, this is where you could start to um, build a, um, a self-sustaining moon, moon village in this kind of environment. I'll press on because I've not only got two or three more slides to go, but maybe I'll save any further questions till the end because we might as well go for the finishing line now. Um, astronomy from the moon. So James mentioned this, um, his an artist's impression, of course, but the idea is that certainly from the far side of the moon where the Earth's radio interference from the Earth is never present. And, and, and so the, the Earth is a very loud source of radio noise because of our artificial radio transmissions. Um, the next most radio noisy thing in the solar system naturally is the sun. Um, but of course, during the lunar night on the far side, the sun isn't in the sky either. So on the far side of the moon, 
during the lunar night on the far side, you've got 14 days when neither the Earth nor the Sun are in your sky. And so there's, then there's essentially no natural or strong natural or artificial radio sources. And so all you've got are the very weak radio sources from the galaxy and beyond. And so this would make, this is why the far side is such an ideal place for radio astronomy. Um, so, so if we had a moon base, we could um, uh, use it to send construction crews and radio astronomers to the far side and build kind of radio, radio exhibit. Uh, very briefly, I just want to say something about biology, because you think about the moon and it seems it's all space technology and it's all uh, geology and uh, astronomy, physical sciences. But actually, there is a lot of biological knowledge we could learn about how things grow or develop in low gravity and and non uh, and, and, and radiation environments which are less um, amenable to life than, than, than the surface of the earth. Now a lot of that work, radiation biology and microgravity biology, has been done on the International Space Station. So here's a nice picture of the space station in earth orbit. Um, but the interesting thing here is, and here's a picture, this is the ESA astronaut, UK ESA astronaut Tim Peake on the space station. And he's, this machine he's pedaling is a European Space Agency experiment to study the loss of muscle strength in, um, in, in zero gravity. Um, now this is a big problem of course because humans lose muscle strength and calcium from our bones in zero gravity. Um, what we don't know, because the Apollo missions were only on the moon for about three or four days at maximum, is what, what, is the, what, what is the effect of low gravity, but not zero gravity? If you live on the moon for three months in one sixth of an Earth gravity, what does this do to your muscles? Does it have a similar effect to weightlessness, only not quite as bad? Um, or does it not have any effect at all because a sixth of a gravity is still enough gravity for the human body to function normally? Well, we don't know, and so you could doing such experiments on a moon base would, would tell us how the human body reacts to one sixth, to prolonged exposure of one sixth of a gravity. And you can't do that experiment on, on the space station because the gravity is zero on the space station. Now, one of the reasons we really want to know that is in the future, we might want to go beyond the moon. Um, I hope this is from The Martian, the movie The Martian. I don't know whether everyone's seen the movie The Martian. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Uh, and this is a fantastic movie about, um, about an astronaut who gets marooned on Mars, played by Matt Damon. And here he is sort of carrying some stuff to his big pressurized rover. Now, I think you could make, I, I've been talking today about why all the still reasons for building a moon base. In the more distant future, I can think of similar reasons to want to build a Mars base. But the thing is, before we build a Mars base, we're going to have to understand how the human body reacts to low gravity, but not zero gravity, low but not zero gravity for months at a time, how the human body reacts to radiation, the space radiation environment, how we can mitigate that and control it, how the human body reacts to fine dust. So this is fine Martian dust. The moon is also covered in fine dust. This is a could be a real problem, the dust will get everywhere, need to control it somehow. And so the point is, I think by building a moon base, we'd learn a lot about the moon, of course, and the earth, but we'd also learn how to um, live and work in space so that eventually we'd be in a position to build a Mars base, or maybe bases elsewhere, maybe even Mercury, who knows, but, we, but the moon is the place to start, I think. So I think I'd better finish. So I think this is, uh, here's another, drawing of what a near-term moon base might look like. But this is what I, um, this is what I think we need. Um, so if anyone wants to buy me a Christmas present, you can please buy me a moon base. <laughs> very grateful. Okay, thanks very much. I'd better stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, anyone's got. So there was a question in chat, what is the far side of the Earth? Well, that's a good question. So of course the Earth doesn't have a far side. Whether, whether something's got a far side or not depends where you're looking from, right? So when we look at the moon in the sky, the moon has this peculiarity. It rotates about its own orbit one a month, as I described. Um, and that's the same time that it takes to orbit the Earth. So the moon orbits the Earth once a month. I mean, that's what a month is, basically. 
And in a month, the moon also rotates on its own axis in the same time. And this has the, the effect that it always keeps the same side of its, the moon. It's always pointing to the Earth. This is why we only ever see one side of the moon. And we call it the near side, because it's the side that points to the Earth. And the far side of the moon, we can't see. So I call it the far side. You need to be in space to see the far side. But if you're on the moon, the same doesn't apply. If you're on the moon and you look at the... Um, if you look at the Earth, let me go back to that Kaguya picture. Here we are on the moon looking at the Earth. Um, the, moon, the Earth doesn't spin once a month. The Earth spins once a day. So if you uh, stood on the moon looking at the Earth here, you would see the entire Earth spin around doing one revolution in 24 hours. So from the moon, the Earth doesn't have a far side. I mean, it has a near side and a far side at any given time. But 12 hours later, you'd see the other side of the Earth pointing to the moon. So, so the moon, ha the Earth has no hidden side. So in that, in that sense, there's no side of the Earth that's hidden from the moon, whereas the moon does have a side of itself which is hidden from the Earth. I, I, I don't know whether that answers the question. No, I, I, I think yes. yes. Thank you. So there is another question. Can you make bread in space or on the moon? Well, that's a very good question as well. I don't know whether anybody's tried. So it sounds a simple thing, making bread, but of course, making bread depends on um, having, having wheat and flour. So these could be ported to the moon. Obviously it requires water. Then it relies on yeast. Well, yeast is a living organism. So this is one of the reasons why we might want to learn a bit more about biology on the moon, not just for human health, but other things that we might want to uh, um, do on the moon that in, involve living things. So yeast is an example. You could smell the same, would, could you brew beer on the moon? I mean, this also requires yeast as a living. So, and then uh, the carbon dioxide produced by the yeast has to inflate to blow bubbles in the dough. This will be different in the, if the gravity is different. So I, my, my, I, I don't know, I, I, my, my guess is yes but I think the bread might have a slightly different consistency than bread baked on the earth. It would be an interesting experiment to try. Dina, I guess you should submit this experiment for the next moon mission. Um, so we have, I guess, one more minute. So let us ask Dr. Crawford, what question you would ask what is your favorite question about the moon base? Oh, I have lots of things I would do with a moon base. <laughs> I, I, I think um, one of the things that does interest me is that the moon, because it has no atmosphere and because it has no erosion, um, the moon's surface of the moon has just been collecting stuff that's been falling on it from space for millions and millions of years. So I suspect by searching the lunar soil, it's the thing that, the, if you look at the surface that Jack Schmidt is walking over here, all sorts of things have landed on this surface um, in the past and likely to be preserved. And one of the things that interests me, I, I didn't bring a picture in these slides, but I mean, the solar system has itself been, not been stationary during all this time. It's been moving around the galaxy. Um, and there will have been times in the history of the solar system and therefore the history of the moon when the sun will have been in the solar system will have been quite interesting places in the galaxy maybe close to dense interstellar clouds or exploding stars supernova explosions and i'm very interested in what records of those kind of galactic events we might find preserved in the lunar soil if only we can access enough of it to study it properly. And I think that kind of thing would be greatly helped if there was a, if there was a moon base to operate from. And probably one more question people were trying to ask here. Can we terraform the moon? No, I think, so for those who don't know, terraforming is the idea that you take a planet and make it like the Earth. I mean, giving it an atmosphere, giving it liquid water. Terraforming the moon will be really, really 
difficult. I mean, I hesitate to say anything's impossible, but it'll be really, really difficult. Partly because its gravity is so low that if you give it an atmosphere, it will just lose it again to space. I mean, people talk about terraforming Mars. That would be a, that would even that would be a huge undertaking. Couldn't we couldn't possibly do it at the moment? But in the more distant future, terraforming a larger planet like Mars that already has an atmosphere and already has a lot of water frozen into its crust, um, much well, it would still be very hard, but it would be much easier than trying to terraform the moon. So my top level answer is probably not. But, but, you know, I hate to say that anything's impossible. <laughs> if you dream big enough and think on large enough timescales, maybe everything is possible. I mean, ultimately, everything that's not, er everything that doesn't violate a law of physics is probably possible in some sense. But, but I, I think it would be really difficult to terraform the moon. Okay, well, thank you so much. Yeah, we ran out of time a little bit. Okay, well, you're so all very welcome. Thank you so much. It was extremely interesting. I personally learned a lot and the pictures you showed here, just amazing. So. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing uh, all these, these things. I think they're fantastic. And people are saying thank you in chat. If you want. Okay, well, thank you. Chat. Thank you very much. Thank you again. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time with us. Okay. Well, thank you. So I better stop sharing my screen and then I better, should I stop sharing my screen at this point? Is yes, that... you can stop sharing thank your you. screen. Yes. All right. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Well, I'll say goodbye. So goodbye everybody. And thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you.